It is with a heavy heart that I left the San Francisco International Airport. My two children, ages 11 and 8, know that we have been discriminated against because of our religious beliefs. It just doesn't feel good. Discrimination in any form and at any age is a hard pill to swallow. I try and explain what happened to my two children. Somehow they don't, they know we are different and that maybe we are not American enough. Here, this policy affects both Muslims and Sikhs. The Sikh Coalition's TSA report cards have judged SFO International as one of the worst airports in the country in terms of the percentage of Sikhs profiled. I myself fly frequently and have flown 13 times out of SFO in the last year and have been pulled aside for secondary screening all 13 times. While the TSA is busy checking my turban, others can walk by with just about anything under their sweatshirts, skirts, or slacks. Let's not forget that the Christmas Day bomber hid explosives in his underpants. My turban actually fits more tightly around my head than my pants do around my legs. So why is this important? Uh, is it just a minor inconvenience for Sikhs uh, and Muslims who wear religious headwear? No, it breeds a culture of suspicion and hate to the broader public. Every time I walk by and I'm subjected to extra scrutiny, people look, people wonder, what did he do? We know that there's no dress or color for airline bombers, whether it's the Christmas Day bomber or the shoe bomber. The city of San Francisco must tell the TSA that we will not tolerate such discriminatory practices, not in our backyard, not now. There is no beeping sound when I walk through the special door, but every time the cop stops me and puts me in a glass cage, <clears throat> they take me to a machine and make me touch my turban and then put something in the machine. When I ask the cops, they never tell me what I did wrong, and they do not, do not let me talk to my parents. I think cops do to me at the airport is not fair. Maybe you can tell me why I'm the only kid put in a glass cage. Why are the other kids put in a glass cage? I wonder, why are we doing this? What kind of a country are we living in where a mom can't go and comfort her child in his own country? Why are we creating suspicion in the minds of everyday citizens about people who look, look different? Um, I came to the ACLU in part because of what was happening after 9-11 and the way that um, Arab, Muslim, Middle Eastern, and South Asian communities were scapegoated. My own mother was in the Japanese internment camps during World War II, and really these communities are the Japanese Americans of today. And some of the evidence that was introduced in the court is that we were wearing in certain events, and public events, we were wearing terrorist clothes. We were singing terrorist songs when we were doing a traditional uh, dances. Dropping bombs on people, terrorizing people worldwide with U.S. funds, with military funds. That's terrorism as well. But we cannot fly, we cannot peacefully gather, cannot practice our faith without being hatefully targeted. Even our holy book is being publicly burned and left on the doorstep of our mosques here in our city. The issue here is the fact that the police enforcement agencies is being used as a tool to gather information and intelligence for the federal government. This is extremely important. While preventing violence and ter terrorism is a goal we all share, it must be, be pursued in a manner respectful of the rights of the hundreds of thousands of Muslim Americans living If in the peace activists feel unsafe, if Muslim Americans feel unsafe in their places of worship, in their homes, at work, then all of our fundamental freedoms are at risk. The freedom of each of us to live in a society where we can say, think, and feel as we please is under attack. Unchecked power begets abuse. Police Chief Gascon's statements that Arab, Muslim, and South Asian communities are more likely to commit acts of terrorism come out of the racist tradition of J. Edgar Hoover and may set the stage for increased racial profiling from the SFPD. And as recent history shows, racial profiling creates the atmosphere for police brutality and the murder of civilians, as in the case of Oscar Grant and Andrew Mopin. Certainly racial profiling is not just bad policing. It makes everybody less safe. It alienates community from law enforcement and therefore interferes with cooperation. Uh, we therefore were surveilled and spied on by 
not only by Officer Tom Girard, uh, but by Roy Bullock of the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith. Though SFPD internal policies and general orders offer robust protections, even the best policies are of little value if compliance and enforcement are lacking. I've been with CARE a full year now, and I want to share with you a few stories of individuals I've come across who, as a result of this targeting of organizations, are afraid to become involved, are afraid to, to go to the mosque. And so one of the things that we hear most often is people who are afraid that local law enforcement and federal law enforcement are collaborating to infiltrate mosques. So they are less willing to exercise their religious duty to go to the mosque, to participate in group prayers, because they don't know if they can trust the people they are praying with. However, two weeks after, two weeks after sending my letter, I did receive a phone call from the FBI. The agent named Jadallah told me that he had received my letter and picture from Chief Gascon's office. The agent wanted to meet with me in both my home and the office, which I refused. And they told me that if I did not agree to become an informant, that they would prevent my son from getting his green card. Community life is shattered as the government often forces Muslim immigrants to spy on their own communities or give false testimony with the threat that that Im Muslim immigrant's status will be revised if the Muslims do not cooperate. It so took almost 40 years for my father to receive justice and 46 years for the government to officially apologize to Japanese Americans who were incarcerated in 1942. And yet, the same tactics are again being employed by our government today. We should not allow the violation of civil and human rights to occur under our watch. And declare for those far and near that we are a city that attends to the weak, the oppressed, the homeless, and the immigrant. And we hear the cries of those unjustly treated because at the end of the day, we all live in this city, yearning to make a better life for ourselves, our family, our, and our neighbor. I do not want my kids to grow up in a country where they're pulled aside for the way they look. This is not the American way. I think we can make it better. Now that I do the civil rights work on a daily basis and have been for the past three years in the Bay Area, I'm too familiar with the severe undermining and destruction of the lives, humanity, dignity, and dignity of the Arab Muslim and South Asian community by law enforcement and government targeting. Right. So I think it's very important that all of us look inside of ourselves and ask ourselves, what does it mean to be an American? And what does it mean to inherit the rights and freedoms that were struggled for, that were died for, that were sacrificed for, and what can we do collectively to preserve those freedoms? And if we don't work together, both those in government and those citizens out here in the streets, then those freedoms inevitably, they're going to disappear. I want to begin uh, first by thanking all those who have worked hard preparing for this hearing. The Coalition for a Safe San Francisco, which encompasses Asian Law Caucus, CARE, AROC, and several other organizations, uh, the representatives are present in this room. And certainly, the staff of the Human Rights Commission, Nadia Babella, Janelle Wong, our Executive Director, Teresa Sparks, and, and many others, also, our commissioners who are taking the time to spend a long evening, I assume tonight, right here in the room to listen to all, to all your complaints and, and all your concerns. In fact, nine years ago to this date, just like many people in this room, I was part of the audience and the community when the San Francisco Human Rights Commission held the first public hearing in the United States to address violence and discrimination against people perceived to be of Middle Eastern descent. At the time, 47% of Americans said they had a favorable attitude towards Islam, according to an ABC Washington Post poll released October 9, 2001, less than a month after the attacks of 9-11. Nine years later, the number is lower by 10 points. Since 9-11, there has been a steady rise in Islamophobia in this country. However, recent months have have, have seen the exponential rise of anti-Islam and anti-Muslim bigotry. Anti-Islam rhetoric has reached a fever pitch as the discussion of the Muslim Community Center in Lower Manhattan, dubbed as the Ground Zero Mosque, has been punctuated by the threat of Quran burning 
and President Obama's alleged allegiance to Islam continues to be a central topic of debate. Americans are hit by a barrage of anti-Islamic commentary almost on a daily basis. Tonight, we will hear from experts and individuals who have experienced this firsthand. The second component of this hearing is the fact that Arab, Muslim, and South Asian community members have been facing consistent interrogation, surveillance, harassment, and infiltration by federal law enforcement agencies. This occurs in their homes, places of worship, and workplaces, as well as while traveling. The Amamsa community has been very concerned about the possibility of the reactivation of an SFPD intelligence unit, potentially violating all San Francisco residents' Fourth Amendment rights. Their fears, ladies and gentlemen, are not based on hysteria, but rather on precedent, such as the 1993 scandal known as the Girard case, where information about community organizations and activists was collected by an SFPD officer and sold to foreign agencies. This fear is not imaginary, and I advise our commissioners and the public to familiarize themselves with what has recently happened in Pennsylvania, where information about an anti-BP candlelight vigil, a gay and lesbian festival, festival and other peaceful gatherings, gatherings became the subject of anti-terrorism bulletins being distributed by Pennsylvania's Homeland Security Office, prompting its governor, Ed Randell, to publicly apologize. The community wants to preempt this from reoccurring rather than waiting for an apology after irreparable damage has been done. Again, you'll hear from both experts on this topic and the victims of such policies. I want to thank the HRC for holding this incredibly important hearing, and I want to thank all the members of the community who are here. We all know that since 9-11, every single one of us have heard too many stories from the Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim, and South Asian American communities, uh, and stories about individuals throughout the country, but particularly here in the Bay Area, who have been targets of racial profiling and inappropriate surveillance. I think in San Francisco, we all pride ourselves on our diversity. We all pride ourselves on the amazing international community that we are. And we also pride ourselves on being a city that does everything we can to foster cooperation between our diverse communities and with law enforcement. I can tell you as a former criminal prosecutor, without that level of cooperation, without trust, everything falls apart. But unfortunately, we know that racial profiling and inappropriate surveillances only serves to continue to drive wedges when cooperation is what is needed the most. And so I want to thank those of you on the HRC as well as from the community that I think planned a very good agenda for today and really helping to understand the atmosphere that we are in right now, the history and the practices that we've seen here in San Francisco. And I look forward to hearing from the community about what we should do. And I know that I speak on behalf of my colleagues. We are very eager to understand what we should be doing as a city. And I know we're going to be looking at the recommendations that come from the HRC to figure out from this dialogue, how do we move us to a place where we can hopefully continue to be an example of a city that understands these principles, understands what our country and our civil liberties are about, and really move this conversation forward to a much more positive place that it's been. Thank you again. Ordinarily, when an American citizen returns home from traveling abroad, he or she expects a homecoming. Yet many Muslims and members of the South Asian and Middle Eastern communities who travel ab abroad routinely expect their homecoming to involve an interrogation, extensive search, and even detention at international airports or land borders. During such encounters, U.S. border officials often question individuals about their religious practices and political views, questions that few Americans expect to hear from armed, uniformed federal officers who essentially are conditioning the terms of their re-entry into the United States. Where do you worship? What groups do you support? Why did you donate money to your mosque? Do you hate the U.S. government? These encounters often based on a person's national origin or acts of religious or political expression, send a powerful message of exclusion at the very doorstep of our country. 
uh, my line of work uh, uh, leads to me frequently, well, periodically traveling outside of the country. And until very recently, and I must admit the situation has gotten better, uh, I, I knew inevitably when I came back into my country after easily without any checks or stops going into Britain or Canada or wherever that I'm going to be stopped and I'm going to miss a flight and I'm going to be asked a series of meaningless questions. And uh, one time I became so frustrated that I took out this card. This is a Department of Veterans Affairs cards that U.S. military veterans get. And I earned this by serving four and a half years in the Air Force. And uh, I was on the verge of just throwing this at the officer and telling him to just take this because it doesn't mean anything as far as I'm concerned. It doesn't mean anything to not have a criminal record, to have served your country, to uh, have, have sacrificed to struggle both with yourselves and others to try to make yourself a better citizen, a more responsible citizen. And just because you're a Muslim, you're exposed to this humiliation. Uh, but as I said, I don't want to dwell on that because there are other people such as Adil, who I would have loved to have heard his story, who have far more moving stories and, and who have been far more touched by this climate of, of suspicion and increasingly a climate of hate and fear that's uh, befalling this country. I just want to say that it's critical going forward that not only are citizens uh, informed, motivated, and standing up to demand their rights, but it's also critical that elected officials and people in government like yourselves work with citizens so that collectively we can preserve the rights and freedoms that many who have preceded us in this land have sacrificed for. Because there are people who will be perfectly content to take them away for economic reasons, political reasons, for a, a litany of reasons that we can stand here all night and enumerate. So I think it's very important that all of us look inside of ourselves and ask ourselves, what does it mean to be an American? And what does it mean to inherit the rights and freedoms that were struggled for, that were died for, that were sacrificed for, and what can we do collectively to preserve those freedoms. And if we don't work together, both those in government and those citizens out here in the streets, then those freedoms inevitably, they're going to disappear. Thank you. Hi, my name is Joe Sink. I am a sick boy. I am eight years old and was born in Menlo Park. I am a fourth grader at Walter Hayes School in Palo Alto. I love music and play the viola and the piano. I enjoy playing soccer and basketball, and I have a green belt in karate. I did not go for my soccer practice today because I wanted to come here and talk to you. When I grow up, I want to be a cop. I think cops are cool and make everybody safe. I do not like the cops at the airport. I've been on a plane more than 10 times since I was four years old. There is no beeping sound when I walk through the special door, but every time the cop stops me and puts me in a glass cage, <coughs> they take me to a machine and make me touch my turban and then put something in the machine. When I ask the cops, they never tell me what I did wrong, and they do not, do not let me talk to my parents. I think cops do to me at the airport is not fair. Maybe you can tell me why I'm the only kid put in a glass cage. Why are the other kids put in a glass cage? For the next vacation, I want to drive, not go on a plane. Thank you for listening to me. My name is JJ Singh. I live in Palo Alto, California. I'm the president of All Documents, a company in Redwood City that employs about 40 people. About 20 years ago, I graduated from Stanford with engineering and business degrees, and I've served as a CEO of about three California companies. I am a Sikh American. I wear a turban because according to my religious beliefs, I believe in equality and freedom for all. However, I'm here to talk about when I travel, what happens. I travel about eight or 10 times in a year, mostly on business all over the country. Since 9-11, I've traveled more than 100 times. 
and I've been pulled aside randomly 99% of the time. There is one time I was not pulled out. My teenage son, who was 17, was in high school last year, in college this year, traveled around the country as part of his high school debate team. Ten debaters around the country. He is pulled out every time. He is 17 years old. There was a specific incident at the airport, which I want to relate to you, as relayed by Jenny Savage, the high school debate coach of Palo Alto High School. She says, and I quote, I watched as he was taken to the bullpen again and subjected to the lengthy, humiliating process. of being interrogated. The rest of our team watched. In a, through the plexiglass, I tried to make eye contact to reassure him. Trying to lift his spirits, I grabbed my camera saying, smile. Three TSA agents took my camera away, erased the photographs. This is not the only time this has happened to him. The one time I have not been checked was in Texas last year. I walked through the metal detector. An African-American gentleman six feet, six inches, 300 pounds, gave me a hug saying, I am sorry. I do not believe we are doing this to you people. I know our policy is wrong. I apologize for everybody. I do not want my kids to grow up in a country where they're pulled aside for the way they look. This is not the American way. I think we can make it better. Thank you. All of my boys wear turbans, and I know that the TSA will pull them out every time. I have them take out their metal coins, iPods. They're known to remove their metal bracelets. But they say, Mom, what difference is going to make? Even if we don't beep, we're going to be pulled out 100%. I remind them to be polite and courteous, no matter how humiliating the experience. At the airport, I walk to the metal detector first, because I can grab the bags. And every time, they are put into that glass pen. And I watch people whisper and stare, as if they've done something wrong. I see that my little one is not smiling. My other two are acting very heroic and stoic, although they're humiliated, obviously. They also know that the people are staring and pointing at them. Last year on a trip to Hawaii, my little one wanted called out to me from the, from the glass pen, and uh, the TSA agents didn't really let me go over to him. When I reach the boarding area, of quite a few times I find people moving to change their seats so that they don't necessarily have to sit next to us. When my boys go to the restroom, people stare at them with a funny look, which my boys are aware of. I wonder, why are we doing this? What kind of a country are we living in where a mom can't go and comfort her child in his own country? Why are we creating suspicion in the minds of everyday citizens about people who look, look different? I'm tired of seeing my family harassed 100% of the time. I would like to stop this racial profiling. Thank you. My name is Fuad al Audi. I am a Yemeni American citizen. I have no criminal record whatsoever. The only criminal record I have was the San Francisco airport when I traveled. Not Texas airport. I went to, through Texas airport and I was greeted very well and I was, and my travel was smooth like everybody else. This time when I came on September 16 last week, I went through the custom line and I was singled out by the custom and border uh, officer. And I was uh, referred to a secondary check. There, and three officers were questioning me about my passport, if it was, a, uh, if the picture in the passport was my real picture. And I said, look to the picture and look to myself. This is my US passport. Then he was trying to ask me a question if I had used a gun in Yemen uh, or where I have been to, uh, in Yemen, uh, what, what places I have been to Yemen. I, I told him I cannot respond to these questions. I was pleased to uh, be advocated by uh, some attorney from Muslim Care and the Asian Law Caucus about my constitutional rights, and I refused to comply with him to answer these kind of questions. And he told me, your attorney cannot attend. I told him, I have to have an attorney here. So you can't ask any question you want. And he said, you know, you are considered in the border, and your attorney cannot come to the border. I told him, I am a US citizen. You cannot prevent me from entering the US, either by land or sea. So the guy took me to a detention room, 
and searched my body and took my laptop and confiscated it and took all the information from my laptop and from my iPhone. I urge all the commissioners here and the San Francisco officials to take measure in this and protect us as a U.S. citizen from this kind of discrimination. Thank you all and have a good night. Good evening. My name is Fatima Shahangian. On July 4, 2009, I decided to marry a man who just happens to be American, Muslim. A year before that, he traveled to Iran for a documentary. On his return back, he was not let back into the terminal. Between the plane and the terminal, they were checking passports. Once they checked his passport, they looked at each other and took him. He was detained for several hours. All of his footage, all of his work was taken away until his lawyer was able to get it back. Because of that incident, I was told not to marry him because it would bring shame to my family's name because my family would now be threatened and watched. However, I did marry him, and I shortly found out what they were talking about. On my honeymoon, on my return from Alaska, I was not let off the ship until my husband and I were examined for several hours and detained. A part of this was to look through our honeymoon photos, because for some reason that was relevant. After that, just a couple of, just about one month ago, we went on a Mexican vacation with my family. We were not let back into the country until we were detained and everything was looked through. One of the female officers asked me to remove my scarf. I went into, I told her I cannot do it in front of men. She took me into the restroom where she said it's okay to take it off here. However, the stalls were only yay high and I was still exposed. I said I cannot do it this way. I said I had to kneel down in the restroom and remove my scarf and unveil myself for her to check my hair. Right now, my husband is in Pakistan working with an orphanage. He is working on a documentary there, and I'm afraid that because of this, he will not be let back into the country. It is a shame that somebody can go try to help orphans and not let, be let back in. From that time on, I have seen, from the time of 9-11, I have seen that civilians have taken on approval from the government to act the same way the government is acting. I merely ask for the government to set a better example. Thank you. My name is Karen Korematsu. I am co-founder of the Fred T. Korematsu Institute for Civil Rights and Education at the Asian Law Caucus in San Francisco. My father was Fred Korematsu, who was born in Oakland, California, and grew up here in the Bay Area. In 1942, my father defied the military exclusion order that incarcerated 120,000 Japanese Americans during World War II and forced them into concentration camps throughout desolate areas of the United States, of which two were located in California. This order proved to be unconstitutional as it was targeted against an ethnic group of people and deprived them of their civil li liberties because they looked like the enemy. In 1944, my father took his case all the way to the US Supreme Court and they ruled against him. Korematsu versus the United States is still studied today as a central case of constitutional law. In 1983, my father again challenged the court when he learned that the U.S. government had lied to justify the incarceration, and as a result of the evidence, his conviction was overturned by the U.S. federal court in San Francisco. With his fight for justice and his work as a civil rights activist, in the years that followed, my father received the nation's highest civilian honor in 1998, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. After 9-11, my father was one of the first to speak up against the dangers of targeting the Muslim Arab South Asian community, as this was alarming and too similar to the same institutional racism that had impacted his own Japanese American community in 1942. It took courage for my father to fight against this government twice, and when he agreed to reopen his case in 1983, one of his main reasons was so that the unjust racial and media profiling societal violence and violation of civil and human rights would not happen again to another ethnic group here in America. It took almost 40 years for my father to receive justice and 46 years for the government to officially apologize to Japanese Americans who were incarcerated in 1942. And yet, the same tactics are again being employed by our government today. We should not allow the violation of civil and human rights to occur under our watch. This commission has the opportunity to be a leader in demonstrating respect and restoring community civil liberties 
as these ab abuses also are happening around our nation. I strongly urge the San Francisco Human Rights Commission to have the courage, as my father did, and stand up for what is right. Thank you. I've been asked to come tonight to, to speak to you about the San Francisco Police Department's General Order 8.10, and I'm very pleased to do so because the ACLU has been involved in discussions and working with the police department about that general order since its inception. But I just have to say on a personal note how honored I am to be part of this conversation. Um, I came to the ACLU in part because of what was happening after 9-11 and the way that um, Arab, Muslim, Middle Eastern, and South Asian communities were scapegoated. My own mother was in the Japanese internment camps during World War II, and really these communities are the Japanese Americans of today. Um, and so I really, it's very meaningful for me to be able to participate in this as well. Um, General Order 8.10 was adopted in 1990, and it places restrictions on the police department's investigation of constitutionally protected activity, such as um, picketing, marches, assembling for political and social causes. And what the general order does is it limits the opening of criminal investigations to situations where the police department can articulate uh, actual facts that give a reasonable suspicion that there is criminal activi activity afoot. It can't be a mere hunch. It can't be a mere sense that this group is dangerous. It has to be actual facts that give rise to articulable suspicion. So where there's First Amendment activity involved, that's what's required. And I want to point out that the definition of First Amendment protected activity includes activity protected both by the U.S. Constitution and by the California Constitution, including but not limited to expression, advocacy, association, or participation in expressive conduct to further any political or social opinion or religious belief. And I think it's really important, I'm going to continually emphasize that the general order covers religious activities, religious organizations, and religious groups. And so any investigation of groups or activities or people based on a relationship to religion, religious practice, has to come under the general order and its protections. Now, in 1994, there were amendments made to the general order. Um, in response to the Gerard case, where uh, it was discovered that a San Francisco police detective had been keeping files on thousands of individuals and organizations, including Arab American, African American, civil rights, and anti-apartheid groups. Out of that scandal that the commissioner mentioned earlier came additional requirements for the general order, um, auditing requirements. So under the current general order, San Francisco Police Departments have to request authority to open any investigation that involves First Amendment activities. They have to specify in the request what the facts are that give rise to this suspicion of criminal activity. And that those requests are reviewed monthly by a designated person on the police commission, and there's also an annual audit of the San Francisco Police Department files to monitor compliance with the general order. Um, after a review of the audits for the last several years, 10 or so years, it reveals that authorization for investigations has been pretty rarely requested. Um, while the public cannot know for sure, the, the really low number of requests for authorized investigations raises some questions about whether those requests are being made in compliance with the general order. Um, and and so I'm going to recommend that the commission and that the police commission also really look carefully at the audit of all of the police files to make sure that the requests are being made as required. Um, as you'll hear from many speakers this evening, Arab, Middle Eastern, South Asian, and Muslim communities feel under siege because of the law enforcement surveillance that they're experiencing from the FBI. Um, these law enforcement practices impact the community members' ability to freely exercise their religious beliefs and practices and also to be engaged civically. But both, and because San, Francisco, San Francisco's federal partners are so heavily involved in surveillance, there's bound to be pressure on the San Francisco Police Department to do the same. 
Good evening. I'm Ross Mercarimi, supervisor of the 5th District. Uh, delighted to join uh, a number of my other colleagues and a number of people from the uh, City Hall uh, family and, of course, with the citizenry. Uh, thank you for allowing me to say just a very brief, quick few words. I have a plane to catch, and I did not want to miss this, uh, so I'm right on deadline. Um, <clears throat> I was a legislative aide approximately 15 and a half, 16 years ago when uh, to then Supervisor Terrence Hallinan, uh, who was leading the uh, effort to expose then the San Francisco Police Department's intel unit by then Inspector Gerard. I learned a lot in that process uh, as a legislative aide here in City Hall and then years later working in the District Attorney's Office. Um, needless to say, uh, reminiscent of that experience and what we learned back in 1994 and 1995, uh, and then hearing uh, potential evidence that there may be of like-minded interest in resurrecting an effort uh, that was uh, strongly um, insisted upon that it be uh, dismantled by the citizenry of SFPD, uh, that certainly brings good cause uh, for concern. Uh, I also am uh, of Iranian heritage uh, in noticing that some of the emphasis that had been placed by recent comments uh, by SFPD for a number of reasons uh, that affiliate their motivations uh, with in trying to enhance security uh, because of uh, tension points with any number of communities uh, abroad, such as in the Middle East and elsewhere, uh, certainly, I think, requires us to be that much more sensitive and clear as to exactly what is our own law enforcement intending uh, to do, and should they do it, doing it, I think, with the mindfulness that they would expect that reflect the values and, I think, of the outlooks of the people of San Francisco. Uh, I, I know that this august body will certainly uh, help drive that effort, and I, along with my colleagues, I'm sure, uh, we'll do everything we can uh, to help be part of it. Thank you very much. Well, good evening. My name is Jeffrey Blankfort. Uh, I was a co-founder of the Labor Committee on the Middle East in 1987, along with Steve Zeltzer, who you'll hear from in a moment. Uh, we were surveilled and spied on by not only by Officer Tom Gerard, uh, but by Roy Bullock of the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith, which was closely collaborating with Officer Tom Gerard in spying on over 10,000 individuals and 600 organizations in California. And this should be known, the Anti-Defamation League uh, has been spying on individuals in the United States going back to the 1930s when it provided information on the National Lawyers Guild to the first House Committee on American Activities. And today, even though the Anti-Defamation League agreed in San Francisco not to spy or collaborate on spying on individuals, it conducts something called the LEARN, the Law Enforcement Agency Resource Network, which goes to police officers and trains police officers, takes them to Israel for counterterrorism training. So today, the Anti-Defamation League is working with law enforcement agencies all across the country, uh, spying on Muslims, spying on people who they believe fit the terrorist profile. And so I would suggest that um, when you are conducting your uh, business that you should contact the local Anti-Defamation League to make sure they are not spying once again on Arab Americans and Muslim Americans. At that time, by the way, they were not only spying on Arab Americans, they were also spying on members of the anti-apartheid anti activists, which Steve and I both were, and South African exiles, because Officer Gerard and the ADL spy Bullock were also working for the South African government intelligence, spying on anti-apartheid activists and South African exiles for the South African government, which an FBI investigation revealed. Uh, my name, again, is Michelle Shahadi, uh, and I am here today to testify about my experience when images and uh, thinking of a community becomes an attitude of law enforcement and becomes uh, an official policy. Uh, I emigrated to the United States in 1975, fresh from high school to come to the United States to pursue my higher education, 
to become an American citizen and to pursue uh, a dream of becoming a citizen and with all the promises with that. And when I came from Palestine, I lived under military occupation. So for the first year, I was inhibited. I was afraid and not sure. But when I learned about the Constitution, the First Amendment, I internalized those issues. I internalized those concepts. For the second year, you couldn't shut me up. I was speaking on everything. So I was active speaking against, for example, US military intervention in Central America. I was speaking about the relationship between the US government and South Africa, and gay rights, social issues, and so on and so forth. But what was dear to my life, and what was dear to me, is when I realized that Americans don't know about me, don't know about Palestinians and Arabs. And I said, this is the cause that I need to be involved in. So I began to be active to uh, organize cultural events, to organize teachings about the Middle East and the Palestinian issue. And, you know, that, that was something that I felt so good about. But in 1987, someone there, someone didn't want me to speak about these issues. And someone somewhere didn't want my voice to be heard. So in 1987, my life was shattered as I was arrested uh, by 12 civilian agents from different agencies with three police cars in front of my house, aiming guns at my, at, at my house, and a helicopter hovering on top of my house. I got arrested in front of my three-year-old son, and they dragged me out, left my son in the house, and put me in jail for three, maximum security, for three weeks. 21, 23 days to be exact. And what was the charge? The charge was that I belong to a terrorist organization. I was charged under the McCarran Walter Act, the 1952 McCarthy era law that was designed to target active immigrants. But then, after three weeks, we realized that basically the government, they have nothing against us because my ordeal have lasted for 20 years. I was targeted for deportation from 1987 till 2007 when the government finally put a statement out that we now concluded that those people have done nothing wrong. We were exemplary citizens. I was myself and seven others. We were dubbed by the media as the Los Angeles 8 case. It was designed, it was uh, categorized by the ACLU, the civil liberties case of the 80s and 90s. And, and after 20 years, for the government to conclude that we have done nothing wrong, it's amazing because we now had a chance to look at the, at the evidence. And some of the evidence that was introduced in the court is that we were wearing in certain events and public events, we were wearing terrorist clothes. We were singing terrorist songs when we were doing traditional uh, dances. This kind of, uh, of accusations that we got, and we suffered for 20 years. All the dreams that, that we have, the best years of, of our lives have gone because we defended ourselves against uh, unjust and unfair charges. That proved at the end untrue. Hello, my name is Sam Hayesh, and I am here because on March 21st, 2009, I was one of the people that were not only to be arrested, but also to be discriminated against. We were sitting at Civic Center BART, arrested by the police officers that also said some hurtful things to us. They were telling us, we need to go back to our country. We need, we need to stop protesting and doing what we, what we are doing. We were told we were told that we were, you, they used the slang and the term, you people and you terrorists to us. And they kept, so we were told that by a lawyer, me being a juvenile, I was not to be handcuffed to an adult, which I was. Also not allowed to be left in 850 for more than two hours, which I was sitting for six hours. All our charges were dropped 
But now me and my friends from my youth organization, AO, the Arab youth organization, are scared to go to the protesters because we are afraid that another March 21st will happen. Thank you for your guys' time. My name is Lily Haskell. I'm an organizer with the Arab Resource and Organizing Center. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about an experience that uh, I was with one of the youth who came up earlier. We were arrested on March 21st of last year um, at a protest. And uh, I really believe that we were arrested, myself and the other youth who were leaders in um, our community in many protests that had happened beforehand, that we were arrested and targeted because of our political activity by the SFPD. Uh, these are the same officers who had seen us at a number of protests, who had seen us leading um, and picked us out of the crowd um, based on our activities. Um, at which point they charged us with, uh, with felony charges that were all dropped, but basically the repercussions of which were um, many thousands of dollars lost in uh, bail bonds as well as several nights in jail and um, turning over our DNA to the state. Uh, let me be the first to congratulate the San Francisco Human Rights Commission for showing political and moral leadership for scheduling a most timely hearing on the issues related to racial and religious profiling and surveillance as it relates to the Arab, Muslim, and South Asian communities. But more accurately, as it affects all of San Francisco citizens, including historically African Americans, Asian, and Latino communities. Your task is not easy, as it does run upstream from national media pundits and a cadre of self-designated and may I say self-promoting expert, vested in distinct politics of fear, xenophobia, and racism, as well as Islamophobia. Also, I may add, they're laughing all the way to the bank with their efforts. In the few minutes I have in front of you, I would like to direct your attention to a few critical issues, but will address them both as a community member and in the broader sense as a professor who teaches and writes on racism, structures of power con and control, as well as marginalization, which more often than not, than not is directed at, pe at people of color, the poor, and those less connected. I would like to direct my comments to the immediate problem of, of Islamophobia, but not to the exclusion of other forms of racism, but to see it in, it, in its interconnectedness and continuities. The March 2010 statement by Police Chief Garcon is a system of a larger problem that we all must, be, must confront. Let me be more specific. Today, it is un, it's an undisputed fact that the Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim, and South Asian communities have been cast as a threat, enemies of the state, and all measures are directed at preventing a security threat from being actualized from within. If you just listened like I did on the drive here to KCBS 740 radio, Today, the subject in one of their commentaries was about homegrown terrorists and the threat they pose. Islamophobia can be looked upon as about aggregating Arabs, Muslims, Middle Eastern, and South Asian into a threatening, homogeneous, undifferentiated community. This week, the Inspector General, our federal government, not some external watchdog agency, our very own federal government, made public a report that stated that since September 11th, the FBI has made some troubling decisions, and in fact, some of their probes have been improper. As Michael German, a former FBI agent himself, put it, quote, the report clearly shows that the FBI was improperly spying on people's First Amendment protected activity, and that the FBI didn't have enough internal controls to prevent abuse, end quote. The Inspector General's report says that in some cases, agents began investigations of people affiliated with activist groups for factually weak reasons. In others, the FBI extended probes without adequate basis and improperly kept information about acti activist groups in its files. While this may be news to some, this did not come as a surprise to me or to any of my colleagues in the national security and human rights world. Since September 11th, we have received harrowing accounts from clients and ourselves witnessed the McCarthyite tactics of the FBI and Joint Terrorism, Terrorism Task Force against both political activists and the Muslim community at large. Anecdotally speaking, what I as an activist attorney has see, have seen in the community has gotten much worse since 2008. Not coincidentally, it was in December of 2008 
that FBI Director Mukasey ushered in new internal guidelines, rules that individual agents must follow in their investigations. These new guidelines significantly expanded the FBI's investigative techniques by allowing agents to initiate assessments without a factual basis, recruit informants without a preliminary investigation, profile individuals based on their race and religion, conduct investigations at the request of foreign agencies, on US citizens, foreign agencies, and data mine personal information, all with less supervisorial oversight. Today, I want to focus on two particular aspects of these new guidelines. That they allow agents to initiate assessments without any factual basis, and that they therefore open the door to racial and religious profiling. Because individual agents no longer have to report opening or closing assessments to the FBI headquarters or to the DOJ, there is no oversight and there is an incredible room for abuse. And in fact, we as advocates in San Francisco and the communities in which we work have seen and felt the repercussions of this. I have dozens of clients, normal everyday Americans from the San Francisco Bay Area who have been approached by the FBI at least once if not several times and on a regular basis. I have clients who are small business owners, American citizens who are regularly visited by the FBI at their place of work in San Francisco. I have clients who are university students who have been visited by FBI agents right off of campus. I, have an, I, have, I know of an educator who is regularly visited by FBI agents. And what do all of these people have in common? Nothing, except they're all innocent Americans who pay taxes, contribute to their community and the economy, and who have immaculate criminal records, no criminal record, but who just happen to be Muslims. While we know and have known that the FBI has free reign to investigate anyone, and while we know of these troubling abuses, San Francisco, a city which prides itself on progressive values, just hired 40 new terrorist liaisons, according to Chief Gascon's one-year report. And none of us even really knows what that means. We have a memorandum of, of understanding with the FBI, and few of us knows what that looks like. There's little to no oversight or transparency of our local government's complicity with the abuses of the federal government. This is affecting San Franciscans, the culture of our city, and our safety. If peace activists feel unsafe, if Muslim Americans feel unsafe in their places of worship, in their homes, at work, then all of our fundamental freedoms are at risk. As an attorney, I have both Muslim and non-Muslim clients. But I'm here to today to discuss some of the unfortunate things that are unique to my Muslim clients only. These are issues that my non-Muslim clients have never faced for the sole reason that they are not Muslim. I did encourage my clients to come and testify for themselves. So you would have the benefit of hearing their stories in their own voices. You could hear the frustration and pain in their voices explain to you how the system has failed them, how the FBI has used tactics of intimidation and coercion against them, how their lives have been forever affected by our government, by their government, all because they happen to be Muslim. All of the clients that I spoke to hesitated to be here today out of fear, Fear that by simply telling their stories, they would only be adding fuel to the fire that is the injustice that they have suffered. For this reason, I am here today to share with you some of their stories. And for confidentiality reasons, I will leave out the identities of my clients and I will attempt to share their stories in the first person. I am a legal permanent resident of the United States and a citizen of Egypt, and I am Muslim. I have lived in the United States with my wife and children for over 20 years. My adult son had a pending green card application when I was first contacted by the FBI. An agent called me and told me that he wanted to meet with me and talk to me about speeding up the process for my son's green card. I met him and another agent at a local Starbucks. The agents told me that if I wanted my son to get his green card, that I needed to become an informant for the FBI. I told them that I would think about it. They arranged another with, meeting with me at the same Starbucks. I told them at that time that I didn't want to be an informant for the FBI. 
and they told me that if I did not agree to become an informant, that they would prevent my son from getting his green card. Now, years later, my son is still waiting for his green card. He should have received it. And the reason that he hasn't received it is because his case is caught, caught up in security clearances. There's no reason why my son's case should be delayed. I believe that the FBI is punishing my son because I refuse to become an informant for the FBI. My name is Ray Knabel. I'm a new Muslim. I recently converted to Islam whenever I was in Kuwait. I never thought my whole life I would become a Muslim until I educated myself about the truth of Islam. I'm an American citizen, and I have also honorably served my country as a member of the USA military. This spring, the FBI forced me into exile. In March, I tried to fly home to the USA from Colombia. I was not allowed to board the plane. When I went to the USA embassy, our government took my passport away, and no one ever told me why I could never fly home. Forced to stay in a foreign country with no way to return, having all my rights stripped away from me, being interrogated day in and day out from the FBI with them trying to criminalize someone. What is my crime? Being a Muslim? Till this day, no one has never gave me a reason why they have done this to me. How can an organization get away with such horrible acts? How can the FBI take someone's job and income away without ever giving a person compensation? For days, weeks, months, I tried to cooperate with the FBI. I voluntarily answered all their questions and did everything I could to help them. I have traveled many thousands of miles on a bus from South America. And until this day, I'm harassed severely from the FBI, and no one has never told me why. The main question the FBI asked me is about my religion, Islam, and about being a Muslim. If Muslims don't come forward to tell their story to the public and push laws to protect our rights, then all these abuses will go under the table and get worse. These acts will keep happening to innocent people and destroying innocent lives. Thank you for letting me tell my story, and thank you for taking the steps, whatever steps you can hold our government accountable, and make sure these kind of abuses don't continue. Thank you. Our South Asian, Muslim, and Arab communities are being subjected to interrogation and surveillance and infiltration of their social and political organizations by federal law enforcement agencies in ways that are reminiscent and recall the historic and current repression of black communities. These, rep these repressive tactics come out of the history of the U.S. government's repression of mass movements fighting for social and political justice. Um, this was the infamous COINTELPRO program. The illegal program was spearheaded by J. Edgar Hoover with the backing of military and police agencies nationwide. The goal of this program was to destroy leaders and organizations and to plant the seeds of division and mistrust in the community. My name is Munadir Herzala. I represent the Arab American Union Members Council. Sisters and brothers in the commission, we appreciate your efforts and your genuine uh, work uh, to host this hearing. Uh, I have no illusion that we can uh, end the racism immediately or discrimination. As of two weeks ago, one of my coworkers, an African American, was stopped just for the fact he's doing get out to vote in a white neighborhood. The issue here is the fact that the police enforcement agencies is being used as a tool to gather information and intelligence for the federal government. This is extremely important. As someone who have worked for uh, the building services in San Francisco, my, our members who worked as janitors, who works as the security officers, who has been uh, targeted immediately after 9-11 from putting their pictures, the pictures of the 11 hijackers in the break rooms and putting the names of the workers on it to having the police uh, cars, asking them what they are doing when they're going home at two o'clock in the morning after hard working day until, until up to having uh, clients of a high rising buildings to, um, to, to refuse to be served by a specific person because he, has, he is an Arab or a Muslim who has that name. That's why we see it's appalling that to, to hear uh, the chief of police 
in, uh, in his March uh, remarks, it's appalling to hear that the threat comes from the Arab and the Muslim community when the Arab and, communi and Muslim community members are securing San Francisco high-rise buildings. The perspective I bring tonight is that of an attorney working for an American Muslim organization. And that's a unique perspective because amidst this crisis, it is not only individuals who have been targeted, but organizations. And the impact of that is severe in chilling the willingness and ability of American Muslims and members of the MMSA community to be civically engaged. And so what I want to focus on to start with is the targeting of MEMSA organizations immediately post 9-11. So while on the forefront we were hearing this we were hearing this this material about how we were not at war with Islam, we were not at war with Muslims, we were at war with terrorists. On that same note, the federal government was targeting MEMSA nonprofit organizations. So the first major one to be targeted in this way was the Holy Land Foundation. And they were at that time the largest Muslim charity in North America. Many Muslims consider giving charity a part or a tenant of their faith, and so we're giving through this organization. In the Holy Land Foundation, their offices were raided, their assets were frozen, everything was seized, and it took at least six to seven years for them to even make it through trial. And the first trial resulted in a hung jury, but the impact had already happened. The negative ramifications on the community and our ability to engage and to give in philanthropy had already been damaged. Following the Holy Land Foundation case, Kind Hearts, another American Muslim charity, was targeted. And through this process, the federal government issued a list of unindicted co-conspirators. It was a technical process to bring in testimony um, and evidence from individuals and organizations that they didn't have enough to indict. And this list was over 300 individuals, individuals and organizations. It included organizations like CARE, the largest American Muslim civil rights advocacy group in the nation. It included the Islamic Society of North America, an umbrella organization which hosts a convention that brings 40,000 Muslims to Chicago every year and has been in the United States for 40 years. It included individuals like imams from across the country, high-ranking religious scholars, and really had a chilling effect. So how does this trickle down into the everyday? How does this affect the Bay Area? I've been with CARE a full year now, and I want to share with you a few stories of individuals I've come across who, as a result of this targeting of organizations, are afraid to become involved, are afraid to, to go to the mosque. And so one of the things that we hear most often is people who are afraid that local law enforcement and federal law enforcement are collaborating to infiltrate mosques. So they are less willing to exercise their religious duty to go to the mosque to participate in group prayers because they don't know if they can trust the people they are praying with. Good evening, everyone. It's a privilege and honor to be here tonight and to share our story. I provided written testimony that's longer along with some of the documents. <clears throat> but it is um, indeed, as discussed, ACLU of Oregon assisted with the effort for Portland to safely and successfully remove itself from the Joint Terrorism Task Force. Now, while it is true Portland may have a reputation as a liberal city, I think something you all are familiar with, it was not an easy thing to do. And indeed, it took the election of a new mayor, Tom Potter, who was Portland's former chief of police, to lead the effort. With a background in law enforcement, Mayor Potter understood that operating with the structure of the FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force ran counter to good law enforcement practices and the requisite oversight to protect the rights of Portland residents. Now, Portland um, entered into the agreement annually in a memorandum of understanding that was brought before city council, so we had a public airing of it, and I've attached the 2003 copy of the MOU. Although begun um, in the mid-'90s, it wasn't until 2000 that we discovered it, and we therefore then gathered a small coalition of organizations, um, in addition to the ACLU, I named just uh, a few, the League of Women Voters, um, Portland Cop Watch, and the Portland chapter of the Japanese American Citizens League. I've included a copy of the testimony of um, Henry Sakamoto, a survivor of the internment camps, who noted in his testimony how the FBI had accumulated the list of all Japanese and Japanese Americans living in Hood River, Oregon, from 1937 to 1942. Now, every year, the question of Portland's participation in the JTTF was, posi was um, positioned by our opponents as either you're for fighting terrorism and joining the JTTF, or you want to make us less safe and oppose the JTTF. 
that framework was and is false. One need not participate in a joint terrorism task force and all that it entails to have local law enforcement working with federal law enforcement. One need not deputize local law enforcement as federal officers to have communication and collaboration. A local jurisdiction need not abdicate its proper role and accountability to keep its residents safe. safe. Instead, with proper oversight, local, state, and federal enforcement can, should, and do communicate and collaborate on a case-by-case -case basis. Civilian oversight and compliance with Oregon laws need not be expended to keep us both safe and free. The reality is that by agreeing to participate in the JTTF, a city abdicates both civilian and police bureau oversight responsibility over the individual police officers who are participating in the JTTF. Because to do so, those local law enforcement officers are deputized as special federal officers and given FBI security clearance. Day-to-day -day operations of the JTTF are the responsibility of the FBI and investigations are federal investigations subject only to federal law. The JTTF officers received very high level of clearance. However, no one else in Portland had the same level of clearance. And it's Portland, it's important to understand that they will talk about giving security clearance, but there is different kinds of levels. And everyone in the chain of command um, should have the higher level, and it didn't happen in Portland. The result is to create a system entirely inconsistent with the way enforcement age, law enforcement agencies are structured. And this is not just a question of appearance, but rather ultimately undermines the chain of command, proper oversight, and compliance with Oregon laws. In Oregon, state and local law enforcement officers must comply with a number of state laws and state constitutional protections, as I assume they do here. In Oregon, we have some unique laws, including prohibiting political spying, limiting immigration enforcement. We also have a physician aid in dying in medical marijuana that the federal government has opposed. And we have constitutional Fourth Amendment protections that are different in Oregon than under the federal. Um, when we, but here's the rub, when we turn federal agents, um, our officers over as federal agents, those federal agents are not required to comply with Oregon law. They do not need to follow the constrictions we have against political spying, immigration enforcement, or search and seizure. And they, our officers are expected to know Oregon law and Oregon Constitution, but they also at times need to seek advice from their supervisors. And in Portland, that include not just the chief of police, but also the city attorney. When we deputize our enforcement officers as federal agents, um, we do not know that they are complying with the laws. We have no way to help them or to protect us when they cross over those lines. And if they have any questions, they cannot seek the proper guidance through the proper chain of command. A local jurisdiction is and must be accountable for the activities of those operating on its behalf. In Portland, we expect our police officers to comply with these laws, and we expect the city to provide proper oversight and appropriate training, tools, and resources to ensure compliance. If a city enters into a contract, such as the JTTF MOU, that bars it from providing all of that, it has fully abdicated its role and responsibility. My name is Sakib Kaval. I'm a longtime resident of San Francisco and a co-coordinator of ASATA, a barrier organization of South Asians working to end violence, both within and against our communities. Our membership is in the hundreds, and each of them face harassment, surveillance, and live in fear of being targeted not only by their neighbors, but by their elected officials and policing units like the FBI and SFPD. We cannot fly, we cannot peacefully gather, cannot practice our faith without being hatefully targeted. Even our holy book is being publicly burned and left on the doorstep of our mosques here in our city. And now police, police chief Gascon wants to increase this overt profiling and hate that we experienced by restarting the SFPD's spying program, targeting Arab, Muslim, Middle Eastern, and South Asian members of San Francisco's community. We've already seen what can happen, what has happened, when SF SFPD has this type of spying program. Why restart a program here in SF, a city of refuge, that clearly shows the illegal lengths it will go to in order to harass target and directly attack San Francisco's community members. We are a city that sets a national tone. If this spying program gets your support and is restarted, there's no telling what other police departments across the nation will roll out, especially during this climate of hate and intolerance. We need local legal safeguards to prevent intrusions on our civil rights. 
We need government oversight and increased transparency of SFPD to ensure its policing units aren't violating the rights and safety and well-being of our communities. We need you, our commissioners, to take a direct stand against this climate of Islamophobia and to block SFPD's spying programs. Thank you very much for your time. I was in high school when 9-11 first occurred, and even then I immediately felt the criminalization of myself, identity, and my community. Now that I do the civil rights work on a daily basis and have been for the past three years in the Bay Area, I'm too familiar with the severe undermining and destruction of the lives, humanity, dignity, and dignity of the Arab Muslim and South Asian community by law enforcement and government targeting. Today I'm going to present the commission with a series of, su of suggestions to end this ongoing tragedy on behalf of the community. First, to advise the Board of Supervisors to pass a comprehensive protective ordinance that would ensure the civil and human rights of San Francisco residents in relation to law enforcement. This ordinance would ensure that the San Francisco Police Department is in compliance with the California Constitution, state privacy protections, and that it would protect San Francisco communities from undue search, surveillance, profiling, detention, or arrest at the hands of law enforcement. Number two, uh, the community encourages the Board of the Human Rights Commission to incur encourage the Board of Supervisors to investigate possible restrictions on the activity of Customs and Border Patrol at SFO Airport. The community also advises the Human Rights Commission to reaffirm the importance of sanctu the Sanctuary Ordinance and advise Jerry Brown to allow San Francisco to opt out of ESCOM. To augment these recommendations, uh, the, co the community also offers their main suggestion that the, H the Human Rights Commission um, create an advisory committee under HRC that would hear issues related to the Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim, and South Asian community. This really mattered to us and you know, and you matter to us, you know, and, and, and as we continue to like listen to all these testimonies and con you know, compile this report, you know, like you have our commitment that we want to make sure that, you know, San Francisco is safe for everyone. And there's no one that needs to be walking and living in anybody's shadow. And, you know, and, and that I think it's really what San Francisco is about and that's what Century City is about. So, you know, hopefully we will find a way to make the city safe for everyone and hopefully we can you know, like convince, you know, um, San Francisco Police Department that, you know, there is not necessary to reactivate such a surveillance program. So thank you for being here with us. And the meeting is now adjourned.